My name is Rich Bowen, by the way. If you need anything today, please come ask me. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the project technical lead, Karen Beer Singh. Thank you very much. I see we've got at least a few friends. Usually it's you know, some friends. But I see this time we've got a few more friends. Good to see everybody here. Thank you very much for coming along. It's always uh KB. Who's your the Eat the mic. Yeah, that's gonna be <laughs> No, seriously. Get yeah. How about this? Yeah, okay. Oh I see, I see, I see. That's the authority, that's the sound authority there. Uh, so let's start again. So thank you very much for coming along. It's it's always great to be here. FOSDEM has become sort of like a cornerstone for uh, the CentOS project meeting and getting together for many, many years. I think 2005 was the first time I came here. There were three people who got together for a little CentOS official meeting. I think 2007 we had a few more people and, uh, and over the years we've had you know, hundreds and hundreds of people come through. So it was a pleasure to come here and, and to, spend, to you know, get a chance to meet everybody. Um, what we typically try and do at a dojo is make sure that everybody knows everybody. Um, I'm guessing there's a lot of familiar faces, but during the course of the day, we try and do some introductions as well. Hopefully that uh, that will work well. Oh, hello. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, ju we just finished talking about you guys. So it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Did you turn that on? There's a slider switch on the side. Uh, that's it. Things work better once they're turned on. So, just a uh, just a quick note. It's been it's been 15 years. Uh, we're actually into our 15th year. We finished 14 years of the Sampas project, and uh, it's been I I I know I wasn't around initially when the project started up, but I showed up soon soon after. I think, uh, months after. And it's kind of hard to believe that there are people in this room. I'm not taking any names. I'm not going to want to say you know, how old we are. That I've actually known longer than I've known you know my wife. Uh, there are a lot of other you know a lot of other people that I've got to know over the years. You know, um, there are nephews and nieces who were born after the CentOS project started up who are now going to university. Uh, so it's a, so it's actually quite an emotional piece as well from from my perspective to be here. It's uh, so thank you very much for all the support over the years and everybody who couldn't make it. Uh, as well, you know, we've got some friends who are not able to make it uh, today, and uh, thank you to them as well for for, for uh, all the support over the years. <coughs> now, over the years, we've had we've had like 15 years of evolutionary growth. I like to think that you know we we organically get better, slowly but surely, while we maintain our main platform, right? So we've tried to make sure that we don't break things for people, but so and that means we have to sometimes move a bit slower, releases can slow down, but not breaking stuff becomes quite an important part of the work. Um, and over this course of 15 years, we've had two, I would like to say, reasonably large-scale revolutions. Right? Um, I, I wonder who remembers the first one. Let's say August 2009. Does that help? Uh, okay, so basically it is in August 2009 that we actually came together as a proper project. So we, we had been going at that point for, for a few years. Uh, but we had some, let's say, organizational issues. Uh, and it was in, um, in September, uh, August, September of 2009 that we actually organized ourselves into, a, into like, a, like a group of people, you know, the CentOS board as it were. Um, and then the second revolution, of course, was a few years ago when, uh, when we came on board with Red Hat. That caused a few concerns. I'm, ho I'm hoping that the concerns have now been put behind us. But other than that, I'd like to think that over the years we've created quite, a, quite an interesting, quite a predictable, quite a manageable, stable platform that has worked for people. Um, there's a couple of things I'm going to talk about today. So the first part that I want to run through very quickly is that it's been a few years, right? So, and I think we're on the cusp of the third revolution in the sense that over the last 12 months, right? I don't know how many of you were here last year, but we're talking about organizing ourselves, getting better at what we do, getting more formal at what we do. And we've made a lot of progress. Um, I would say most of which is invisible to most of the users because it's happening behind the scenes. And I'd like to talk through a part of that uh, as, as, as a first piece, and then I'll talk about you know what we were talk, what uh, what we've been building behind the scenes. As in, you know what is the user value of, of the work that we do as a part of CentOS, and what we've been able to achieve in the last sort of twelve months. 
Um, so the first thing, of course, is that it's we built up around community, right? It's, it's basically for the users. That is the driving force. That we've got a stable base that we need to curate, we need to maintain, we need to make available. And then there's basically four areas that we operate in. Um, the first part of that, and we and this is sort of not formal lines, but they could understand it. That will give you an idea on how the CentOS project actually comes together. So the first part of this, of course, is the piece that brings us together, which is the Linux distribution. And, and that itself is split into three parts. So we've got the rel downstream, which corresponds with a lot of the baseline value. But we also have the alternative architectures, things like you know, the Raspberry Pi, um, where we've got stuff on the ARM64. Uh, thanks to the work that has been done in the team, ARM64 for CentOS is actually the default uh, on that platform at the moment. And then additionally, we've got user-driven content. Like we've got a 32-bit CentOS 7 build, which doesn't have an upstream at all. Right? That is completely user-driven. So the second part of what we do is the infrastructure. Um, the infrastructure for the project, the infrastructure that we make available to the community. And, and this basically is composed of, again, three things. So we've got the community-driven stuff. Uh, I don't know how many of you realize that CentOS never actually had a bill before we joined Red Hat. It was entirely self-supported, it was entirely community-driven. And it still remains, our content distribution remains community-driven. It's very important that we retain that support because it is that support which allows us to be as good as we are. Uh, to give you an idea on what I mean, when the kernel was released for the Spectre Meltdown patch, the first of the first set of kernels, I think we've had a few more, and there's going to be a few more. Um, it, was, it, it took less than one and a half hours for us to get that kernel out to just over a million installed user base. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think many of the commercial distributions even are able to achieve those kind of numbers. Right? And the way we are able to do it is because of the community support we get for our mirror infrastructure. So everybody contributing towards that, thank you very much. We do, have, we do have a lot of what we're doing behind the scenes which is sponsored by Red Hat. A lot of our CI infrastructure, for example, all of our CI infrastructure is sponsored by Red Hat. And that becomes a key tenant for us to be able to go and innovate and be able to drive value in the product as well. The third part of what we do is the SIG process. I think we've got a few people in here who are involved with the different SIGs. I won't go through all of them, but there are quite a few. There's at least three people or four people in the room who can actually see the entire list as well. Um, I'm sorry about that. I didn't realize it was going to be that low. But you know, the SIG process is a cornerstone of where we innovate about the platform. Right? That is important for us. And then the fourth part of what we do is the services piece. Um, these are the services that we run as a consumable service. Anybody can come and do it. There are no CLIs. We have a process in place. There is a guide in place that allows you, you know, that shows you how to go about doing it. Community supported but reasonably well SLA. And there's, I think, maybe one person in the room who can actually see what they are. <laughs> uh, we, we'll get to them later, anyway. And then this is sort of what it brings, it brings us down to. On the functional side, the CentOS project today focuses on four avenues of, of execution. Right? And that is basically what it is. The, the, the distribution part of it, which is core to what we do, let's say keeping the mothership in place. The infrastructure that we run around it, all the users, all the content, the build infrastructure. The SIG processes uh, that allows other people to come on board and do interesting things about the platform. And then the services that we run you know, to, to facilitate all this work. But effectively, the CentOS project was always about the people. I remember starting off um, <clears throat> many years ago, and I don't think the value proposition has changed much. I remember talking to Johnny, thinking that, you know, this crazy stuff that we're doing, there's at least four people who use this. Exactly. Right? There's, what are the chances that 100 people might use this, right? And uh, you know, we'll be successful if we get 500 people using it. And, and, the, and the reason for people to use it was not because of what it was, right? We were never evangelical about it. It was always a case of, hey, I need to do this anyway because I use it. It's like you know, I'm, I'm doing, I've got like 100 machines at work. I need to keep the lights on. So it doesn't matter, right? So the value proposition from that point on was that is there a reason for people to use it? And there can be no better reason to use it than to have a situation where the contributors use it. Right? And that becomes a reason for existence. And that, that still remains key to what we do. And so, so in the people's, people's side of things, there are four groups that we, we kind of sort of see as, as functional groups. There's a lot of cross-pollination between the teams. There's a, there's a lot of people who are in multiple teams. There's some people who do stuff across every team. Um, and this, 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 uh, uh, this, there's some people who are more visible than others, but, but each of these groups <coughs> is important to where we go. And I'll just talk you through some of them. 
so we have a core engineering team um, that is that is primarily run by Jim. Jim's at the back of the room there. I don't know if you want to wave out and everybody can say hi. Um, so Jim manages the, the, the base engineering uh, team at Red Hat, which is, uh, is I mean, there's, there's a few people in the room. Um, uh, Brian is here, Johnny's here, Fabian's here, which is which is the which is the bulk of that team. We also have community people who contribute into this space. Uh, you know, we've got, uh, for example, Hansi Johansson as a, as a key person who's, who's who's basically got us to be the first Linux distribution who had an IP6 torrent download tracker when uh, all four users who were using IPv6 <laughs> were able to get the Linux distribution faster and uh, and do all the mirror stuff as well. Yeah, he's he's been our main IPv6 guy. Um, the second team uh, that has come together, that's a much newer team. Um, it has been in existence for about, I would say, 13 months at this point. Uh, if you guys are on the CentOS Devel list, you would have seen some activity from there. That is the CentOS Container Pipeline team. And uh, what they're doing is effectively building our registry infrastructure and our container build, container test, container delivery infrastructure. We'll talk about that in a bit. There are a bunch of young guys, they're based out of India. Um, I don't think any of them are here with us today, but Parmachar runs that team. And uh, he posts regular updates to the CentOS developer list. If you guys are on there, you will, you will see stuff happening in that space. The third part of the people structure, right, is the contributor group. They are the people who come together. This is people working with SIGs, people who are helping us on the forums, people who are helping us on the wikis, people helping us, you know, uh, in upstream uh, infrastructure, people helping CentOS in upstream projects. The contributors who basically come together to build and derive value, right? They, they, they are the people who effectively <coughs> do the work, as in the heavy lifting around the project itself. And then finally, the consumer group, right? The people we do this for, the users. And so, how we how we kind of how we kind of see this coming together right, is that the base engineering team and the container pipeline team are Red Hat sponsored. Uh, people working in that team are primarily from Red Hat, but they are not exclusively Red Hat people. There are people who work at other places, or people who contribute into that space. And, and it, there's no reason for this to be exclusively Red Hat. Uh, anybody interested in helping out with infrastructure? Anybody else, uh, interested in helping us with the pipeline pieces? Please, please do, and people do. I'd say about 40% of the work that happens in the container pipeline team today comes from people who don't work on that team directly. So there's a lot of opportunity there. But one person I want to introduce over here is Rich Bowen, who's uh, hiding in the corner there. Uh, Rich has recently come on board um, from the OpenStack side of things of Red Hat, and he's helping us curate the community interfaces as have a face who's available, somebody you can talk to, somebody who's one key person involved with events, um, and any sort of community engagement can go through him. So, you guys have a face. Please uh, say hi to him during the course of the day. Introduce yourself. He's, uh, he's a very sociable person. And, uh, and thanks, thanks, Rich. Welcome to the welcome to the Logic Cabal, as it were. Thank you. But so, one thing I'd mentioned here, like the, the the guys who drive the innovation, the guys who actually drive the project, are effectively the contributor group, right? And and the kind of impact that they make is that I would say. Most of the user-facing content evolution in the last 12 months has come from the contributor group, not from the other teams. And, I, and there's like so many numbers I could go into. If you guys were here last year, you'd remember I did like 15 minutes on numbers. I won't go into that, but just a couple of things I want to point out is that at, uh, and I was talking about this a little while earlier today, at one point yesterday, uh, at one point in October actually last year, we were hitting a situation where we were shipping one vacant image sort of every six seconds through the month. We shipped almost 700,000 instances of that image. We've had five million downloads of the vagrant boxes in the last 12 months. And that's completely community driven. That's completely contributor driven. Um, and that is sort of like the impact that, you know, that people are making in this space. So how do you get involved as a contributor? Find a, find a problem that you actually have. Think about, think about something that you'd like to solve. Because we feel that, I've always felt that people are likely to do something if it helps them solve a problem that they actually have impacting themselves, right? So if you're using CentOS somewhere and it doesn't do something very well, then that's a great opportunity to come on board and fix it. If, you, if you're onboarding a new kind of technology that, you know, if you now have figured out in your head what the container environment is going to look like, or you have a new container format that is, you know, 10% faster, 20% faster, or three times faster, you can do microservices at the speed of light. And CentOS, unfortunately, isn't in that space. Then come on board and solve that problem. And then we will help you from the project side to define what success means. Like, for example, in the weighted space, what we said was we want to have an image that is updated at least a month, every month. More security pieces go out. 
and we'd like to make sure that there are multiple people involved in that process. And the progress that we've made in the last 12 months is phenomenal, right? Uh, so similarly, like find the places, find the pieces that you care about, come on board, and, and work to fix it. And that is, that is the best way to get involved with any open source project. So have a problem, have a clear definition of the problem, and then go and fix it. Um, the, the other part of it is that if you want to speak to the team, um, the best place to find us is IRC. Now, unfortunately, IRC isn't the best place to go to for everybody. Yeah. So the other best place to actually find the team is on CentOS Develop. A large part of what we call the CentOS team is invisible. There are a lot of people who contribute, you know, who contributed over, you know, I would say a dozen years or more who may not actually have an official place because they choose not to be there, but they will still help you. So come find us on IRC, come find us on the CentOS development list, and there are a lot of people around, I would say more than 100 people at this, at this point in time, who can help you get on right now. Right? Things may be a little slow, that ask for patience, but we will be there to kind of support you through that process. So, any questions at this point before we move into the second part of the piece? Is there any, any specific thing anybody wants to ask about, talk about? Okay. Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe after the after the piece. So, one of the other things that we spoke about was um, the registry, the CentOS registry uh, for containers that is coming through. And I'm just going to talk about that a little bit in, in brief because um, <clears throat> so first, firstly, it's on uh, the it runs from an index which is hosted on GitHub. Anybody can send containers. Anybody can send manifests to build containers there. Right? We ask that the content is free. The content should be redistributable. Or you should be a part of an upstream project. Right? Don't don't uh, don't send uh, don't send a pull request to build. You know, let's say Microsoft Skype. That will probably not get accepted. But but most other pieces will get accepted. And all you need to do to get into that, anybody can do this, is send a little YAML snippet that looks like this as a pull request to that repository. So if you look through it, what we it's just a couple of pieces. You point at the Git URL, points to your uh, Git repo where you got your Docker file, where you got your build. <laughs> And then there's a, there's a couple of things, like what, what tag you want it, uh, it to be at, what path within that repository you want it to go to, what email address you want to notify when builds work or builds fail or whatever. But the other thing that this also does is it does dependencies, which is something that is hard to find. Like, so you can have, you can have, for example, if you're building a LAMP stack, you can have your LAMP container depend on the PHP container, which depends on the HTTP container, which depends on the CentOS base container. And if there are any security issues down that stack, the registry will automatically do a rebuild and update your content and let you know that, hey, we noticed that something down the stack changed, and therefore we thought there's an impact to your container, and we rebuilt it for you. And we'll talk about that in a, in, in, in a second. So basically, this is what happens. You send a pull request. That pull request gets picked up. If it needs a pre-build, like if you, if, for example, you've got a Golang piece that you want to put in, you can actually point to your source repository, and the pipeline will do the binary build for you, and then run the, run the build script, it will do a linting. It will let you know whether you've got good practices, if you've got the right kind of labels, if you have the right kind of security context. <coughs> it will give you a couple of pieces of feedback on how you can improve your Docker file or your build manifest. Um, it will then deliver that to the registry. And what will happen is that on a weekly cadence, it will do a security scan for your content that is in there and send you an email to say that we found issues. It gets a bit more interesting in that Depending on how your Docker file is set up, it can actually send a pull request to your GitHub repository and say that this is the change you need to make in order to remove this particular concern. So, so one of the things, for example, is that uh, one of the best practices is that in a Docker file, you should have a label that defines who the owner is. Since we know who the owner is, because you've got your email address in there, and if you haven't put in a label, we'll send a pull request against your Docker file, which includes that label, and say, look, you should put this in, because it's metadata that is that we consider best practices. Similarly, if you're working with OpenShift, it'll do a validation to make sure that you're not running a container as root, your port number that you're using is greater than you know, the privilege ports, <coughs> things like that. And it'll send pull requests where it can in order to get you past the, the concern that may be. Right? So I think that's it's fantastic. Uh, we use it quite a lot. There's about 460 containers that are in there at the moment. But what we're trying to do is the CentOS container registry isn't actually built to be the application hosting <coughs> repository. Like, if you've got a really cool app that you're working on, you probably will not find value in here. This is more like a Docker build. But the SLA is that your build happens within six hours. 
at the moment we're doing sort of 45 minutes to an hour, but that is sort of like the SLA that we provide. So the game here, the, what we're trying to get to the goal, is that we want to provide a definitive source for your dependencies. If your application needs MySQL, you should get MySQL from registry.centos.org. You can build it app wherever you want, you can push it wherever you want. What I'm trying to get to here is that by doing the work in the container registry, we're trying to shift the value proposition that we've had on the base Linux distribution into the containerized ecosystem. So you have a continuous stream of MySQL, of Postgres, of maybe LAMP, in a containerized payload, which tries to get you to the value proposition of a base, single, predictable CentOS release. Does that make sense? So you've, got, you've, you've now got a source where you know your MySQL is going to be updated all the time, so you don't have to worry about that. You know your Redis is going to be updated all the time, so you don't have to worry about that. But also things like, like Hans is here. So, so the software collections guys do a lot of work in making alternative stacks available. I believe uh, Tom's talking about one of those later in the day today. So if you're using, for example, Golang, and you want to use a particular version that isn't in the distribution, you have an opportunity to go with the software collections team and make that version available. And that then cascades through, because if it's being built through the registry, you know it's being lifecycled. So everybody who wants that version of Golang can then just go and consume it directly in that space. And so that is the target demographic, if you see what I mean, on what we're trying to get with it, is to make is to, is to make, uh, make it a single point of contact for the entire dependency chain under the application itself. And of course, it's at registry of which is hopefully no surprise. Is, is there anybody here who's got a container, except for the software collections guy, is there anybody else who's got a container in the registry today? Mail stuff. Right, no, sir. Right. If you want got cluster in a containerized payload, it's available. But I would, I would recommend everybody else, go take a look, go take a look at GitHub and uh, see what you make of it and we always willing to take feedback as a, as a group of people, um, young guys who are working on it and uh, I think they're making good work. So that is one part of it. The second part of it is that uh, we've made tremendous progress in CentOS to build and innovate above the platform. Like the CentOS Linux piece is, is the so-called new boy. That it just works, it works enough to make sure that you don't have to worry about your platform. So the promise there is that the platform doesn't matter because the platform matters so much that you use a predictable, manageable platform and then you don't have to worry about it. Like if you deploy something on top of CentOS today, as long as you don't take change the version, if you don't go from 6 to 7 or 5 to 6, there is a very high probability that your application that runs today is still going to be running in two years' time after having consumed all the bug fixes, after having consumed all the security patches, right? That is sort of like the value proposition of the baseline. But above that, a lot of the work that has been going in to CentOS for the last sort of two years has been has been focused on what we do in the sort of, you know, I wasn't sure how to name it, so I said you can pick one, either new, modern, or future, or wave, or stack. <laughs> Depending on how you, depending on where you are, and, and what I mean by that is that there is a there is a very interesting move in infrastructure space away from buying appliances to basically operating in the software space. So you can own your stack, right? Um, and typically, how that works is that you start with bare metal, you virtualize it, and then you drop your uh, resources on top. So this would be compute, it would be storage, it would be networking, it would be all the management stack for that. So this would include identity management, logging. Uh, it could be uh, metrics, it could be monitoring, it could be whatever, right on the management side of things. And then, and then above that, you build your user experience. You build your APIs, you build your consumer point of contacts. And then above that, you'd have your applications drop in. Um, and the key thing over here is that right up from the bare metal piece, and this is entire software, which means it's entirely commodity driven, but it's built on best practices in a way that it is sustainable, it is manageable, and then you can go and do this on-prem, right? So if you're using from bare metal, you go all the way from on-prem. And if you're only above the virtualization layer, you're doing this in cloud, right? But the, but the actual tenets of what you're trying to get to don't change. The baseline doesn't actually evolve. The baseline doesn't actually move anywhere else. And then of course, my favorite is hybrid, mostly because I really like the cloud. But it really hurts me every month when I see my credit card getting hit. I find it far easier to negotiate with my wife and just go buy a little bit of hardware, like maybe once a year, and then do a little bit in the cloud. So if it's like 40, 50 bucks or whatever, I'm trying something out, then that works. Um, and so I, like, I really like the hybrid model. And, and here's what the really cool part of this is, right? That you can today do this entire stack up from bare metal on CentOS using content from mirror.centos.org, using management tooling from mirror.centos.org, not having to touch a second point of contact. So this is, this is like a big, it's, it's a big piece for us. 
And this is what we feel that, you know, that what we've been able to achieve with the SIGs, with all the work we've been doing above the platform, etc. That there is an end-to-end -end piece that is coming together on CentOS. Now, what does that mean? The base libraries that all of this stuff links against is the same. So it doesn't matter which part of the stack you're on, the glibc that you're using is the same glibc. The kernel that you've got running at the different layers are the same kernel. The components that you that you deploy in there will lifecycle at sort of the same cadence, right? And that is what the really key part of this is that you go from all the way from zero to being a hero in a setup where you don't have to worry about the platform. So the platform is boring, but it's only boring because it's predictable, it's tested, it's validated together in one place. And I think I think we should just pause for a second and think that going back, let's say two years ago, three years ago, this was not possible. You would have had to go to 40 different places to get the components. There'd be different release cadences you'd have to worry about. There'd be different management interfaces you'd have to worry about. There'd be how do you lifecycle all of this stuff. Today, this is possible 100% on CentOS content. But we don't talk about the application side, right? So let's, let's dig into that in a second. This is, this is my favorite bit. This is what I've been working on for a few months now. <clears throat> so this is, a, this is sort of like a, the flip side of what we are doing in the services piece for upstream open source projects, for upstream application projects, for open source as a service. Um, if you guys were here last year, you would remember that we made a big deal about the fact that we tried to invest really heavily, we're trying to conceptualize, we're trying to you know, get the processes in place, we're trying to get the validation routines in place. That allows open source projects to go to continuous. And what that means is that you do continuous planning, you do continuous execution, you own the life cycle from the entire spectrum, right? All the way from inception of the code to actual execution and production. And this is sort of a model that is now being used across uh, by a couple of projects across CentOS. And I'm just gonna try and talk you guys through this. Stop me, pause me at any point if you want. I'm happy to talk about specific pieces. So, so if you look at the flow of content, the six, the, the content that goes in from that side, the 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 pieces that go in into middle.centos.org, facilitated through cbs.centos.org, the build services, gets picked up by the container pipeline because you can have pieces going through there. Again, the Golang example or Node.js or, you know, there's hundreds of like the Python examples, etc. And they end up at the registry.centos.org. Now, what happens over here is that the delivery doesn't actually happen directly to the registry. There's a lifecycle component in there, the scanners, the linters, the people who are going to curate that container for you or for the community as it were. Um, and that happens continuously. What we're trying to get to over here is we're doing dependency validation, but what we're also doing is we're doing content validation. We're actually scanning the containers to find content that may not have come from an RPM. Like for example, if you have an NPM stack, um, so you probably have one package, Node.js, which came from RPM, and then you have maybe three and a half thousand NPM modules that allow you to say hello world, right? Um, I don't know how many of you use Node.js. But what happens is now suddenly those three and a half thousand pieces are at risk, right? Because they don't have an upstream. So what we're trying to do in the registry piece is we're trying to find ways to analyze that code and actually build metadata around what you've got and then help <coughs> you track that information on npm.org. And this works for RubyGems, it works for PyPy. We've got most of Maven Central hooked in as well. And then of course we've got NPM, a good fair. So what happens beyond that? Now if you have a developer, a developer would typically put a put put through a pull request with some sort of feature work or whatever. So your pull request stream basically becomes developer oriented or it becomes from the container lifecycle. So if you're using MariaDB, for example, in your stack, and there's a MariaDB update, you'll get a, you'll get a pull request in your repository saying, hey, you know, time to update. Or maybe just time to reboot. <coughs> you then ship that through ci.centos.org into a Jenkins pipeline, which can then pull your base images from registry.centos.org and actually, the, the way CentOS CI works is that you can model your target application stack. So, so this little diagram here, which you can't see, is actually a picture of the previous slides where you've got the whole application stack running right above the virtualization group. That validation can happen at the pull request stage. It can be automated depending on the quality of the tests that you've got. That can then help you get to your Git master. We may have a problem here because we build up at the bottom part of it. So, so again, going back, so like you've got a pull request going through, Jenkins, test it in an environment that looks like your production environment, that looks like your target place that you want to get to. Having done that, you get into GitHub, onto, onto your master branch, which in turn itself kicks up another build, 
which validates and builds your content. So if, for example, if you've got, let's, let's go back to Golang, right? So you've got a piece of code that was built at the first Jenkins instance on the Golang container that came from registry.centos.org. It gets validated over there and gets pushed forward. When that push goes to the master repository, you then have an assurance that if you lock by hash, the build that is going to happen at that stage is guaranteed to have the same environment as the build that took place at the pull request stage, right? That is huge value in the containerized ecosystem where everything around you is moving all the time. That becomes a great that becomes a great place to be because you suddenly got developer confidence. If the developer is using the same container for the base from registry.centos.org, then they have the same cadence that they can adopt as well. So the code you write, the code that is tested for merge, and then the code that gets merged has a synchronous environment for, for, for the entire workflow. The second part of this becomes that when you've done your build for your GitHub master, or your master branch in the Git repository, you can then push that to a separate artifacts uh, repository. So you can save it. What that gets you is that for every merge into master, there is a corresponding container sitting in your private registry or in the artifacts setup. Which means if you need an audit trail for your binary artifacts, you have a direct relationship. The only piece of metadata you need is the git commit hash uh, that was used to actually do the build. No, that was actually in the part of the merge master right? And that unifies the entire cycle from developer to binary artifact. This is where it gets interesting. You can now set up a separate git repository. I don't know how many people can see that. But you can set up a separate git repository, which then gives you your approval set. Okay, you just have to believe me. <laughs> so, so you set up a separate Git repository that gives you an approval step. So let's say you've got you're working in a team of 40 people, right, and you have an agreement amongst at least three, four, that hey, is this good enough to go or not? You can have that approval step itself be run through Jenkins on CRR Central through a Git repository which only tracks the hashes of the artifacts that are going to go through which means you're only approving specific code changes happening in your Git repository all the way through to production. When you get to production, the artifacts that get deployed, the applications, the dependencies, all of those pieces map back one-to-one -one with um, the content that has been built at the merge to master stage, so you can actually control <coughs> what you need to do. As an operations person myself, I, uh, I really appreciate that. I like that because what this allows me to do is now basically roll back. If, if somebody says that, oh, hey, you know, we had a production problem, I need to go back 15 days ago. I now have the ability to just go look at my Git repository and I know exactly what artifacts I need, how they were tested, what was the environment they were tested in, what was the content in that environment it was tested against. And I can blindly go and do a rollback, right, without having to worry about anything. Except, of course, there's going to be the one person in the room who's going to raise the database question, right? That, oh, what about my schema? What about my data? So you, have, you do have to manage that. But, but just on <coughs> the application layer, you now have a guaranteed assured environment, right? Now remember, we're talking about the CentOS ecosystem, which doesn't stop here, right? This is only one small part of the whole ecosystem. So now what you can do is you can build your logging infrastructure, your metrics infrastructure, and your monitoring infrastructure around your production infrastructure for your application space in exactly the same way. Which basically means your entire stack, whatever you're doing, whatever you're doing, becomes controllable through one Git repository. Now, if you can control that well, if you can manage that well, you can automate it well, you have a single point of control for your entire application stack. Right? And this could be something small, like I have most of this running on my laptop. And I, and, and, uh, and I have a little, you know, a two VMs that simulate CRS and such all. And I have a few other pieces in here that allow me to kind of go through this. I run COGS that gives me the Git workflow, etc. But this could also be large services, like there's at least two open source public services coming up at Red Hat. So it's one of the pieces that I work on in my day job, part of it, OpenShift.io, where, where this workflow is used to run a 700 node cluster with up to about 40,000 tenants inside it in a continuous environment doing sometimes dozens of deployments a day across maybe about 70 different services. Um, it's, completely, it's completely public, it's completely open, but it's facilitated as a part of the CentOS initiative. Right? It's, it's a part of what we're doing to get stuff out there and talk about how you do modern systems practices, how you do modern scale up work using an open source community. There's no nobody else at the moment doing this kind of work. Uh, and this is sort of like what we were talking about uh, last year when, when Steph did his talk about cockpit. 
that how they build small pieces of code that gets validated at depth across a wide breadth of infrastructure to get you a validated point that you can deploy with confidence, right? And if you don't have the confidence, here's a set of tests that you can go run yourself. Build your own confidence. If you don't believe my tests, if you don't believe when I ran them, here's the tests you go run them. If you've got better tests, please contribute. At different stages, right? And this then maps to applications and it maps to services. What we're really doing is once the framework is up, you can then go and build your service up. You can build multiple pieces. So if a group has an end-to-end -end piece, you can then get maybe 40, 50, 60, 70 Git repositories. The workflows don't change. The pieces don't change. CI.centos.org will still give you the privileges and will still give you the capacity to go execute for reasonably, reasonably large chunks of, uh, chunks of work. I know we've got, we've got Brian here. He'll probably tell me, <coughs> correct me if I'm wrong. But I think we've, we've got projects that consume what? 20, 30, 40 bare metal machines at a time. And, and we've turned over maybe, I don't know how many deployments have we done since we started. Have we turned a million yet? Uh, we're sitting just north of 500,000. So 500,000 machine installs have happened in CI for Centros in what, two years, less than two years? Yeah. So infrastructure is there, resources is there, there is no CLA. Anybody can join, anybody can be a part of it. And this is sort of, these sort of workflows are, are possible. <coughs> what we're doing, right? <coughs> Forget about everything else. What we're really doing is we're getting the developer to own production in a way that the differentiation between the developer environment and the production environment goes away. And how it goes away is not by making production look like developer, it's like making developer look like production and all the tenants that go with it, right? So you've got a stable platform, things are monitored, things are measured, life cycle, etc. Then of course, all of this is possible 100%. This whole piece, all of the different moving parts, all of the different pieces, all of the different relationships, um, being able to do this at massive scale is all possible today on CentOS infrastructure run by, curated by, serviced by the CentOS, the CentOS teams uh, across the board, end to end. So this is, this is sort of like the promise of how do we get open source projects to in continuous. This is the sort of stuff that we're talking about. That you can remove, you can remove a lot of people, you can remove a lot of infrastructure if you don't have it. We can already do that for you. Focus on getting to your target goal, which is sort of like the bottom right there, all the way from the developer experience. In a way that you get best practices, you get all the modern tooling that you want. It's all curated for you. It's built in a predictable way. It's something that you can go and to go and consume today. And all of it works end to end on CentOS infrastructure. So this is me. Uh, my name is Karan Virsay. I think uh, we got we got past that in the beginning. I work at Red Hat. Um, and uh, and this, is, this, is, this is the piece that I have for you guys. So where are we going from here? So the next steps, right, what we want to be able to get to from here, let's say in the next 12 to 18 months, is we're starting to look at machine learning and we're trying to get into creating opportunities for people who are themselves interested in mass scale out in hybrid environments, things like Spark clusters. I think we're doing a lot of work with Hadoop, we're doing a lot of work with machine learning stacks. We're doing, there's a Bitcoin miner who's getting ready to start contributing his code into cbs.sample.org, you should see that soon. Um, so basically, it's the case of building up to the next step beyond this. That how do we go and meet? Um, let me let me do it this way. I still think that we are about three years behind the curve. Being able to do the end-to-end -end experience, being able to do the managed infrastructure end-to-end, -end, we're still three years behind where the fastest-moving organizations are around the world. Well, that maps to the open-source communities. Is we're about two years ahead of everybody else at this point in time, right? In terms of what you can do, how you can do. It. And what we really want to do over the next 18 months is try and get closer to the edge. We want to get closer to the newest innovations that are happening. Making sure that CentOS content is available, that CentOS is usable in some of the newest places. Like um, Some of you may have heard recently about the core OS uh, relationship with Red Hat. And one of the first questions that we got was, hey, where's the you know, system DN spawn containers that I can use for core OS now? And we're like, oh, hey, you know, I don't know. Would you like to come help build it? So yesterday we signed somebody up who's now going to be building up the system DN spawn containers for us. Uh, so similarly, we want to get to other places as well, right? So it's a gap. Like, the fact that we haven't had this for you know the last year and a half is a bit of an issue. So we want to get to that point. Uh, things like the uh, Open Connect Container Initiative is coming through, uh, and there are tools available now that let you do builds for the OCI container stack. Registry.centos.org is going to be able to offer OCI containers within the next 60 days for the entire complement of containers that are built in there right now. So you'll have 500 odd containers available, consumable for for the OCI format as well as for the Docker form. And so that's the, that's the next step that we need to get to. Hopefully when we meet here next year, I can talk to you a bit more about what we've been able to achieve in that space. But we want to narrow the delta down between 
emerging technologies, inception of technologies, to being able to make them usable, consumable. I remember we're doing this with Sandbox Linux. We're doing it with a platform that everybody knows. We're doing it in a way that the processes are transparent, the processes are visible. It's something that you guys have grown to trust over 15 years uh, of time. So is there any, are there any questions? We've got a few more minutes, I believe. Uh, any questions? Anything anybody would like to talk about? Anything specific in here uh, that anybody would like to correct me on? So I didn't go into a lot of details about the two stacks that we spoke about, right? The infrastructure piece where you go from bare metal to the UX part of it. Um, and I didn't talk a lot of details about the I suppose, specifics of, um, of what we're doing with uh, container pipeline <coughs> and uh, how you get you know, from the CI infrastructure and high promotion part of it and stuff like that. If anybody's interested in actually seeing some of this stuff in action, come find me over the next two days. I'm here today, I'm at Fosdom tomorrow. Come and find me. And I'm very happy to walk you guys through existing uh, infrastructure, and existing setups where we're doing this kind of work. Um, sounds good. Thank you very much.